Sophia Pressel. I would like to welcome you all to this fourth webinar in the new series. Our president, Carol Reed, would have loved to be with us today, but unfortunately is not able to take part due to other commitments, and she sends her best greetings. Today, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Claudia Ferradas as our next presenter in this series. Claudia is an experienced presenter and ELT author based in Argentina who travels the world as a teacher educator. Among many international presentations, she held the closing plenary at the ICEFL conference in Cardiff in 2009. She is a lecturer in advanced language and literature at teacher training and translation programs and has run MA seminars and carried out research supervision in Argentina, Spain, and the UK. Claudia works as a consultant for the British Council and has co-chaired the Oxford Conference on the Teaching of Literature on five occasions. She has also worked as project manager for the Penguin Active Readers Teacher Support Program. And now I'd like to mention some logistics of the webinar today. First of all, we will be seeing Claudia's photo but not the live feed in order to prioritize her presentation. And if you have a question, we have a special question answer box set up below the slides. Please type your question in here and not in the chat box. And at the end, or during the webinar as well, I believe, Claudia will endeavor to answer as many as possible. And please try to distinguish between just comments and questions so it is clearer for Claudia to know what to answer. Um, in addition, at the end of the webinar, we will make the slides available for one week for all on the IATEFL website on the webinar page, and the recording will go in the members area. Um, this is done by head office in Faversham, and it, so it will happen sometime next week. I cannot say when exactly they will upload this, but it will be there, so check. And I believe that is the end of my introduction and logistic information. I hope you all enjoy the webinar, and with no further ado, over to Claudia. Thanks. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm sitting at home in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina, where some of you are from, where it's 11 a.m., and believe me, I'm not wearing my pajamas, I'm not having breakfast, as John suggested. It's just that my camera is playing up this morning, unfortunately, so you will see a good picture of me, but you won't have me live on the screen. Good, so you can concentrate all the time on what really matters, which is the slides and the topic we'll be developing. And as I was telling you, it's winter here, but it's an unusually warm day, and I hope you, you will all be able to enjoy it if you're in Buenos Aires or anywhere else where it's unusually warm. And the rest of you, uh, well, thank you very, very much for being here, wherever you are. And I would like to give a warm thank you to Marjorie Rosenberg for inviting me to do this. It's a real honor. And thanks, Mercedes Viola, for her patience. She's been invaluable all week helping me to, uh, to you know, set up this video. So thanks, Sayatefo. Thanks very much to you all. Now, we're going to be talking about reading across cultures. If we had more time, if the technology allowed it, and it does in a way, we would be sharing our views. I would be asking you to turn on your microphone so we would spend hours. I would be asking you, what do you see through your window at, at this moment, for example? I know that John told me he can see some cowboys. I suppose they are gauchos, gauchos in, in Brazil. I don't know. Uh, that, that in itself would be a wonderful uh, way of, you know, reading us across cultures. But today, given the fact that we've got only one hour, uh, I would just like to open some food for thought and share with you a couple of texts that I think you, you will find really enriching. So, without further ado, and as one is supposed to do an introduction when a talk starts, let's have a poem called precisely an introduction. I don't think there's anybody from India on the list. I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I can't see anyone from India. Uh, this is Kamala Das, Indian writer. And I have just copied on the PowerPoint uh, a very short extract from this long poem and introduction. Have a look. She says there, I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar, 
I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you? Why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. Its distortion, its queerness is all mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is human, as I am human, don't you see? So, as you can see, Kamala Das raises issues that have got to do with language and identity. Why choose one language rather than any other? Why choose English, the, the language of international communication, rather than whatever language it is that you speak or you write at home? So, uh, interesting, one of you saying so much for accuracy. Uh, and, and Roy is saying that. Um, I'm trying to look at the two screens at the same time. Um, yeah, it, indeed, that's also an issue that is raised by a poem like this when she speaks about the queernesses of her own Indian English and she actually uses it when, when she writes. So what we are talking about is cultures in contact which in some way or another will influence the way you speak, the way you write. And I would like to bring up uh, a text by another woman, Mary Louise Pratt, written, as you can see, several years ago, 1992. And she speaks about the kind of cultural contact that results from colonialism. And she speaks about cultures in what she calls the contact zone. On the screen you can see the way in which she defines that contact zone. It's the space in which people, geographically and historically separated, come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict. Doesn't sound too hopeful, does it? Coercion, inequality, conflict. If you think of Pratt's contact zone, you might say, wow, how negative this contact seems to be. And I'm sure that we are all sharing this webinar on a Saturday because we believe we've got a mission in trying to make it less negative and, if possible, very positive. When Pratt speaks about the contact zone, evidently she's speaking about a colonial and imperial sort of experience. Um, but what's going on today, which is our contact town. You may say, well, in my case, uh, I wouldn't speak of a colonial or post-colonial experience, maybe. But think about the way in which these texts may have an impact in an ELT class. Words such as exile, diaspora, borders come up all the time in texts like the one by Kamala Das we've just seen. My country has suffered a number of experiences of exile, unfortunately, and not too far away in time. Diaspora. Many of you are based in places where diasporic movements have taken place, and again, where refugees may be either living today or escaping from at the moment. Borders. The term borders came up a lot in the United States speaking about the impact of uh, Mexican, the, 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 the American-Mexican border and, and, and the way in, in which Chicano literature has developed, for example. But how many borders do we cross every day, even in our own classroom, when we meet people who are very different from ourselves and yet very similar, whose social context, whose family values, whose religion, whose race may be very different from our own, but whose humanity has so much in common with what we all aim at. So it seems that such texts, texts like Kamala Duffy's poem, have a place in the ELT class, even if you say, well, my contact zone, full of conflict, is a very positive one, a very enriching one. So let's see. Oops, sorry. Uh, does this uh, anthropologist by the name of Jane Clifford 
who says that we all belong to traveling cultures today. He says that everyone is more or less permanently in transit. We should not so much teach where are you from in the earliest lessons of English language learning and teaching, but where are you between? And I love this quotation. I think that we are all, all the time, between places, crossing borders, sitting on the fence. And the more we are in contact with people who are diverse, who've got different ideas, different experiences, the more enriching it can be, and also the more challenging. Well, you may say, hmm, my students come from a little village, and they've got very few chances of going abroad, or meeting tourists, or, or visitors from abroad. But then to say, we are all traveling cultures, as we are this very day, as we are talking, even without leaving our tents. What we are so used to, we too often become used by, Michael Joyce wrote many years ago, 15 years ago, and so we must begin to see ourselves in where we are. Increasingly, where we are is on the web. Look, he was saying that 15 years ago, increasingly, where we are is on the web. And I kept a cartoon from those days, a guy who wakes up in the middle of the night to find in his old-fashioned monitor an email from his wife saying that she wants a divorce. And this is the sort of innovative thing that we were laughing at 15 years ago. Uh, you know, instead of uh, that, uh, I see my students saying, oh, I'm crying because I found an SMS on my mobile today saying that he was dumping me or she was dumping me. So maybe the way we communicate, we communicate sorry, has become highly mediated today. Can we communicate without a screen? Can we educate without a screen? Where are we at this moment as we are all together in, in this webinar? Where are our students? And I've seen Gabi Madera joining us working for Plan Ceibal in Uruguay, where the one laptop per, per child uh, model has allowed me to have this picture to share with you. Um, how is this changing the way we perceive otherness, and we perceive ourselves in communication with others. If we are talking about ubiquitous and mobile learning, if we take our learning wherever we go, as you might be doing right now, I don't know, you may be doing this from a smartphone, how are we related to others? How has the contact zone become liquid, become something that changes all the time? And does it have to be a place of conflict? as Rhys Pratt warned us in 1992. Well, this all has to do with language and identity, as we were saying at the beginning. And Bonnie Norton, who did a plenary session at IFEPFL in 2009, when I had the honor of closing the conference, said this, and I am quoting from her conference and from her book, Language and Identity. Every time language learners speak, they're not only exchanging information with their interlocutors, they're organizing and reorganizing a sense of who they are and how they relate to the social world. They are, in other words, engaged in identity construction and negotiation. And you seem to be saying that in your chat, which I can see from the corner of my eye, how we are renegotiating our identity every time we open our mouths in our mother tongue. So what happens when we do so in a foreign language or in several ones? In the past, and I suppose you share this experience with me, we had a native speaker model. The presupposition was that when we learned a foreign language, our utterances should bear the meaning that native speakers would normally attach to them. I remember my teacher saying, Claudia, think in English. And they were in some way asking me to suffer some kind of linguistic schizophrenia. They wanted me to be someone I was not. Because yes, I often think in English today, I think I have become quite bilingual. But there are times when I can only think in Spanish or in my little Portuguese or in a mixture of these three. You're all at least bilingual, if not plurilingual at the other end. And you say, yes, I think in English. Yes, you're, you're writing there. 
And how often is it that you can't find the words in your mother tongue? How often is it that you cannot find the words in English or in, in any other language? And you would like to code switch all the time. Uh, from Santo Tomé, Maria was saying today that she was going to get the mate ready. And in most of my talks, I start by saying, how do I manage to tell people why we drink mate the way we do? Maybe at the moment you have a cup of tea next to you, a cup of uh, caipirinha, I don't know, a glass of caipirinha, I don't know, somebody else in Brazil or in Portugal, I just don't know. But whatever you have has to do with who you are and your culture as well. So, Carmen is saying, sometimes I don't find words in my own language. Of course, because you probably learned to think that thought in another language. So this plurality, how can it make us richer? How can it empower us rather than make us try to imitate a native speaker and feel that we're never totally up to it? Sir Kramsch was saying back in 1993 that we learners of foreign languages have the right to use that foreign language for purposes of our own. And so these purposes are the ones I would like to talk about today because I often feel that textbooks, particularly those meant for, for a global market, do not really allow us to express our own meaning because we are not given the words. I don't have the words to explain to you how we make a good mate, why we drink it, why we pass it on, uh, you know, opposing challenges to our health because we all drink out of the same uh, metal pipe, out of the same bombisha. And I don't have a word for bombisha. I need to find ways to paraphrase that, to explain to you what sort of a metal pipe it is and the fact that it's got a spout so that I don't burn my, my lips but that there's much more to it than that, that it's not just structure and vocabulary, that it's got to do with who we are and how much we share when we pass them out from hand to hand. So, um, we are supposed these days to aim not as a kind of imitation native speaker, but that we are supposed to be coming to cultural learners and John, who's writing avidly on the chat, uh, is being quoted here. John Corbett, welcome to our group, and it's such an honor to have one of my veterans in, in the group this morning. Uh, John defines the intercultural learner, you can see this on the quotation, as one who is linguistically adept, although not native speaker proficient, who has skills which enable him or her to identify cultural norms and values, which are often implicit in the language and behavior of the groups he or she meets and who can articulate and negotiate a position with respect to those norms and values. What John is telling us in his very didactic way is that we are not supposed to stop teaching the language system, of course not. We need to become proficient, we need to become understandable and accurate enough, but that we need to go beyond that, that we need to identify cultural norms and values in the texts we read in the, pe in the people we listen to, in the videos we watch, and take a position. Say, all right, I'm learning something here. Do I want to change my way? Do I want to imitate what I'm learning? Or do I want to say, uh-huh, uh, we do it in a different way. I respect the way the other person does it, but I'm going to do it my own way. And it all sounds very well, but it's such a challenge. If we knew how to do this in our everyday practice, we would be at the United Nations today trying to stop war, as I suppose we are all thinking of doing. But maybe from our little corner of the world, we can make a little contribution. You, Many of you are working in Europe, and if you're not, you must have read anyway this document, which has become so important for our profession, the Common European Framework. And the, the European Framework speaks from page one, and it was published in 2001, of an intercultural approach, and tells us that it is the central objective of our jobs of language education to promote the favorable development of the learner's whole personality and sense of identity, 
in response to the enriching experience of otherness in language and culture. So I suppose we're here in this webinar because we believe in this. But then, how do we do it? How can I take into a primary classroom the kind of text and the kind of approach that would like me to carry out this kind of language education, this intercultural education, from day one? We're talking here about a context zone. We're talking here about crossing borders. Borders between self and other. And the question I posed in my plenary session back in 2009 for IFEPL was how can learners profit from the enriching experience of coming into contact with otherness? Not just by learning from otherness, but by reflecting on their own values and identity and on the construction of their self in it. You've been discussing, I can see on the chat, how artificial geographical frontiers have become, how we keep crossing those borders, how little it means, what nationality we are, and yet how much it means when there is violence, when treatises come into the picture. How do we manage to encourage in our students an attitude of communication across borders rather than the other way about. What contribution can we make to the achievement of these aims from our own little room within education, which is teaching a foreign language? And what materials and pedagogic strategies can we select having these aims in mind to encourage this thinking zone that Carmen is talking about in the chat? Well, one of the things that have been proposing for many, many years is to open up our classrooms to world Englishes, the beautiful ungrammatical plural that we've been using for several years now, and then encourage responses to texts from a variety of cultures that express themselves in English. Not only standard English, which of course is very important and we're not going to discuss this, uh, you know, for exams, for international uh, business and, and educational context, I'm not denying that. But we do need to be more open to the queernesses of Kamala Das's poem, to the queernesses in our own Englishes and whatever other foreign language we speak. This openness will probably allow our students, particularly the weaker students, to feel more empowered, to feel that their mistakes are part of their learning and that varieties do not necessarily involve mistakes, but precisely that, variety, and that I can respond to that variety with my own variety, negotiating content, negotiating difference and similarity. Above all, and I'm going back to Claire Cranch, we need to address the problem of wanting to express one worldview through the language normally used, to express another society's worldview. When I read a text from, say, Nigeria, South Africa, Singapore, wherever it is that people are publishing in English or speaking English on video, I feel I want to respond. And I remember the days when I couldn't find the words to explain to you why we drink mate, why we pass on the mate. The words to express a worldview about drinking as a ritual, drinking as a way of establishing friendship rather than drinking to make yourself, um, you know, unconscious because uh, we, some people like to do that and drink alcohol and whatnot. And we start talking about why we do things, how we do things, and then communicating in a foreign language or lingua franca, an international language, becomes so meaningful because we're expressing our own worldviews responding to other world, world, world views. But how do we find the words? Well, what I keep proposing is using texts from the student's own culture. And you may be saying, Talia, but that will not be in English. Well, very often it's not. We can always find texts in translation or texts actually written in English from people from our own culture more and more because 
more people want to get published internationally, and so they're using English in their own varieties with their own queernesses. And, you know, I know this used to be a sin in our classroom, um, and you're talking about what we were made to believe uh, in, in the chat, uh, but I love to bring into my, my classes a text in Spanish, that's my mother tongue, from, from my own culture, and put them in contact, responding to other texts in other cultures that express themselves in English. So that's my, my first contribution to this approach. And then, not just put the text side by side, but, but carry out this comparative approach, see in what way we differ, but in what way we are similar. And so teaching what language new students need to talk about themselves. I'm sure your students keep asking to you, how do you say whatever it is that is highly local? And there is no word for that in English. But there are ways of paraphrasing it. There are ways of glossing. There are ways of expressing what that means in your language, in your culture. So why not prioritize that in our classrooms? Giving our students skills by responding to texts from abroad with their own texts and their own meanings so that they can explain their own customs, talk about their own beliefs, talk about their own habits in English. Maybe we need to rethink our planning. Maybe we need to rethink what words and what paraphrasing strategies should come first in the early stages of learning. I don't know. Good for thought. So, all this is meant to lead to intercultural awareness. And may I strongly recommend uh, whatever John Corbett has written on this, the wonderful activities he's put together uh, for intercultural awareness. John, you, you're, you're allowed to see where to find them. I can already see you're, you're sharing uh, a link on, on the chat. But it also has to do with identity investment, which is the term that Bonnie Norton uses in language identity. What do we mean by this? I have the feeling, I don't know if you share it, and you can use uh, a tool at the top where you can write yes or no, or you can... Um, uh, <laughs> John Corbett says that the, the cowboys are staring at him. Oh, my God. Uh, sorry about that. Um, what, what I mean is intercultural awareness in the textbooks we use very often has to do with giving you a variety of pictures in Unit 1 from different countries, from different ethnic groups, and, and you teach, where are you from? I'm from Australia, I'm Australian. Where are you from? I'm from China, I'm Chinese. Isn't that so? Typical unit one in, uh, you know, in, in, in elementary textbooks. But then, do we give students the same opportunity to talk about themselves and their context? If we do, then we are doing this. We are allowing them to invest part of their learning, their time, their energy, in expressing their own identity. But if we just follow the textbook, probably we don't. So, enough chattering. Let's have a look at some classroom implications. We've given this a kind of twofold approach. On the one hand, I ask, what materials can we select? And on the other hand, what are we going to do with them? So, I'm sure many of you are acquainted with this text. And, and I can see Gabby already saying, I love this bear hunt. It's a very well-known picture book by Michael Rosen, whom you can see in the picture. And he's such a generous writer that on his webpage, and you know that you will be, will be given all these links, so don't worry about that. Uh, on his webpage, he has uh, shared with us a number of his poems, and he actually videotaped some, some of them. And he's uploaded the videos, and I would like to say how grateful I am because Mike had responded in 10 minutes to our request to share with you one of his videos. This beautiful book, We're Going on a Bear Hunt, which you can use at kindergarten level, at first form level in primary school, uh, that even gym teachers love uh, when they take the, the students camping. Uh, well, this video, you can, you can uh, do a web search and you can find it in animated version with the very same illustrations that the picture book has, has got. Uh, but what I would like to ask Mercedes to do now is to share with us uh, Michael Rosen um, performing, not even reading this book, 
and I'm sure you will enjoy it. If you feel it's a bit long, uh, believe me, if you're not acquainted with the poem, it's really worth it. We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day! We're not scared. Uh-oh! Grass. Long wavy grass. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. Oh no! We gotta go through it! Swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy, choom, 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 choom. We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day! We're not scared. Uh-oh! A river, a deep, cold river. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. Oh no! we got to go through it! Shoo! Splash, 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 choom! We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day! We're not scared. Uh-oh! Mud. Thick, oozy mud. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. Oh no! we got to go through it! Squelch! 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 We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day! We're not scared. Uh-oh! A forest. A big, dark forest. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. Oh no, we gotta go through it. Stumble, trip, stumble, trip, stumble, trip. We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Uh-oh. A snowstorm. A swirling, whirling snowstorm. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. Oh no, we gotta go through it. We're going on a bear hunt, we're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day! We're not scared. Uh oh. Okay. A narrow, gloomy cave. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We got to go through it. Tip, toe, tip, toe, tip, toe. What's that? One shiny wet nose. Two big furry ears, two big goggly eyes. It's a bear! <gasps> Quick, back to the cave! Tip top, tip top, tip top. Back through the snowstorm! Hoo woo! Hoo woo! Hoo woo! Back through the forest! Stumble, trip! Stumble, trip! Stumble, trip! Ah, back through the mud! Squelch, 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 squelch! Back through the river! Splash, 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 splash. Back to the grass. Swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy. Get to our front door. Open the door. Up the stairs. Dup, 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 dup. Oh no. We forgot to shut the door. Back down the stairs. Dup, 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 dup. Boom. Back upstairs. Dup, 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 dup. Into the bedroom. Into bed. Under the covers. I'm not going on a bear hunt again. Well, you seem to have liked the video as much as I do. It's a fantastic book, isn't it? You've already said why it is so good for the classroom. Now, 
You may be asking yourself, what's this got to do with uh, reading across cultures at all? Well, uh, the first thing is, mm, you know, there are bears. I very often think that my students here in Buenos Aires, when I used to teach primary school, thought that they could get out into the streets and find a bear any minute. Well, you might say, yeah, that's a child's imagination. That's great. On the other hand, um, why is it that we never focus on the fact that bears here in the southern hemisphere are not local animals? What would happen if we wanted to transfer this fabulous poem of a book into a local version of it? This is something I proposed to teachers in Patagonia a couple of months ago. And we got fantastic poems in Peninsula Valdez with whales approaching the coast. And just looking for the sounds we needed for the poem was great fun. But it was also a way of becoming aware of the words we need to talk about our own context. And of course, you may go a little bit further and talk, think about preservation of the environment and say, how many bears are left in what different contexts? Find out, talk to the teacher who is in charge of the science area of the curriculum and then say, could we do a little project together, and uh, you would be amazed to see the number of Argentine animals I read about through the transposition of this picture book to their own local context. And of course they can draw their own picture books, they can produce picture books online very easily, they can upload them, they can be as low tech or, or as high tech as they wish, depending on your context and on your objectives, on your teaching style even but you would be reflecting on otherness, on the bears that are so lovely to read about, but also on self. Self and other crossing borders, meeting in what Claire Crouch would call a third place, sitting on the fence, finding the words for identity investment. So this is Michael Rosen's webpage. And you will find there a, an amazing treasure chest of texts to start developing your own ideas. So, what I've been suggesting is a kind of textual intervention, and using here Rob Pope's terminology for this kind of methodological approach. And I've shared with you in previous presentations, so apologies if you've heard me before, this little list of suggestions for textual intervention. For example, if you're using any narrative or any play, any reader in, in class, though surely there are missing scenes, missing dialogues that the writer decided not to write. And a wonderful invitation to intervene, to become co-authors of the text. And then you can ask the million dollar question. And what would happen if the missing scene of di or dialogue happened where we live? How would the scene change? And again, otherness and self meet, and you cross borders. Or change the point of view. If the narrator is female, how about having a male narrator? If the narrator is a child, how about changing it to an adult? You're also crossing borders there. Our cultures, that marked by the generation or electronic gap, are also very different as we go across different ages. Isn't that so? So culture doesn't mean meeting the exotic. It also means meeting the variety, the diversity that we have in our own neighborhood, in our own home. So in this adventure of becoming co-authors of the text, we can imagine a character's thoughts, especially if we've got very little English. We can just have the illustrators in the classroom uh, do teamwork with the ones who are more linguistically apt already, and one will draw the storyline, the comic strip, the other one, the character thoughts. The others who are more, more into the actor style, dramatize what is told. The ones who love storytelling, narrate what is communicated through dialogue in the text. So all these techniques can be integrated. And above all, they allow the diversity in the class to become teamwork rather than a disadvantage for those who are less linguistically apt or slower as language learners. They will show how necessary and important they are to the team as a whole. Um, 
My favorite, as you must have noticed, if you go down the, line, down the list of, of text intervention techniques, is the what if question. What would happen if Cinderella didn't lose her shoe on the way out of the ball? What would happen if um, Snow White fell in love with one of the dwarfs? Am I going too far? Anyway, uh, depending on the age group, this kind of what if question can be really fascinating and you will decide what kind of questions will be asked or get the students to ask them. And you might say, mm, I haven't thought conditional sentences yet. Well, try the simple present. Suppose the prince is drunk when he meets Cinderella. Will she accept him? And we are totally changing the story. And what's more, we can put values into play in this discussion. And that is where, again, our differences and our similarities will come up. Then we can change the ending of the story. That's something we would love to do in life sometimes. Well, at least we can do it in fiction. And that's all part of the, of the game we can play. And then we can explore other media. I've noticed that Jennifer Verscher has joined us. Welcome, Jenny. She was teaching another webinar just, uh, what, half an hour ago? And uh, explore other media. That's what she does all the time. If you're reading a text, how about having a video of it, a vlog, a vlog? If you have a video online, how about writing the text, etc., etc. So these ideas, I know, we use them all the time in our classrooms, but we can always give them a little cultural turn of the screw. And I insist, but I mean cultural, I don't mean exotic. What I mean is bearing in mind our differences and we, what we also have in common. So let's pass on to another example. We talked earlier on today about varieties of English. And if we're thinking of a slightly older age group, or even much older age group, and if we want to bring a different variety of English from standard English into class, Benjamin Zephaniah, I know, is our favorite poet, performance poet, city. And again, many thanks, Benjamin, for allowing us to use your video. Uh, I'm going to ask Mercedes to play a video in a few minutes, but before, let me show you. Oh, there it is. There's the video. Uh, don't worry. Let's show the video, Mercedes, and then I'll, I'll show a little bit of the text. So let's play. Talking turkeys. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas, because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool, and turkeys are wicked, and every turkey has a mum. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Don't eat it, keep it alive. It could be your mate and not on your plate. Say, yo turkey, I'm on your side. I've got lots of friends who are turkeys and all of them fear Christmas time. They say, Benj, I want to enjoy it. But those humans have destroyed it and those humans are out of their mind. Yes, I've got lots of friends who are turkeys and all have the right to a life not to be caged up and genetically made up by a farmer and his wife. No, turkeys just want to play reggae. Turkeys just want to hip hop. Have you ever seen a nice young turkey saying, Amen, I cannot wait for the chop? No, turkeys would like to get presents. Turkeys want to watch Christmas TV. Turkeys have brains and turkeys feel pain in many ways like you and me. I once knew a turkey. His name was Turkey. He said, Benji, explain to me, please. Who put the turkey in Christmas? And what happens to Christmas trees? I said, I'm not too sure, turkey. But it's got nothing to do with Christ, mass. No, humans get greedy and waste more than need be. And businessmen make lots of cash. So, be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Invite them indoors for some greens. Let them eat cake and let them partake in a plate of organic grown beans. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas and spare them the cut of the knife. Join Turkeys United and they'll be delighted and you will make new friends for life. Turkeys. How many of us eat turkey for Christmas? How many of us celebrate Christmas? I can see that most of us come from South American countries, some European countries, and uh, Susie is based in Israel. So, um, but if we had even a 
greater variety, we would see, well, some people don't quite know what we celebrate in Christmas. Some people who are non-Christian would probably want to speak about their own uh, religious festivals and how they celebrate them, etc. But we all have um, a unit in the textbook, a unit in the syllabus that's got to do with festivals and uh, we discuss what we eat and how we celebrate and the presents we open, etc., etc. So that is, of course, a wonderful topic for intercultural awareness. But let's have a look at the text. I will not even try to read it with uh, Benjamin's Jamaican accent. It would be a joke. But see how to spelling, and if you're acquainted with Benjamin's poetry, you know this only too well, he tries to reproduce, <laughs> don't want me to try, no way. Um, uh, he, he tries to reproduce the way he speaks in performance through spelling. Look, look at the screen. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. This the, that we cannot pronounce if we are uh, speakers of Romance languages and he cannot pronounce either, so it's this Christmas. Because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool, turkeys are wicked, and every turkey has a mum. This is, of course, apart from this question of cultural identity related to traditions, related to religious festivals. Also, Benjamin is also talking about another culture, which is vegan culture. He would not eat turkey simply because he's more than a vegetarian, he's a vegan. And that in itself opens another kind of intercultural awareness. In my country, Argentina, and I think Argentinians and Uruguayans will agree with me on this, we take so much pride in our cattle raising and in our meat industry that we cannot think of someone being a vegetarian. And then, do we respect vegetarians when we invite people to dinner? Do we have enough vegetarian restaurants to cater for those people? Are there enough vegetarian dishes in restaurants? Things like that opening up discussion on something that probably the science teacher is dealing with as regards nutrition might be linked with a cultural issue in this poem. So, Gabby was saying lots of values there. Some of you were saying, Carmen, I think, I have lesson plans based on Benjamin Sephaniah. Yeah, lots of values there. You're already enthusiastically uh, exchanging uh, if not recipes, at least the, the, the names of, of the food you eat. Well, that's a beginning to do with intercultural awareness. But what about giving this another turn of the screw and thinking of turkeys as turkeys who have a mum and would like to, to eat some veggie dishes with you for Christmas. Look at what he says next. I've got lots of friends who are turkeys and all of them fear Christmas time. They want to enjoy it. They say humans destroyed it. And humans are out of their mind. Yeah, I've got lots of friends who are turkeys. They all have a right to a life, not to be caged up and genetically made up by any farmer and his wife. So once again, what sort of food are we taking to our table? Is it genetically manipulated? Is it organic? And once again, we're using a text in a different variety of English, coming from a different culture, to reflect on ourselves, on our diet, on our table, on our customs. So, many thanks again to Michael Rosen and Benjamin Sefnaya for letting us use their videos. And I would also like to thank Carlos Moscardini. Some of you were saying how beautiful the music was, but you were waiting uh, for, for this webinar to start. Uh, and I would like to highlight the fact that he has allowed us to use all uh, his records uh, for this webinar. So those of you who like tango, uh, Silencio del Suburbio is his latest CD. It's downloadable from the web. So Carlos Moscardini, um, keep an eye on his records because it's really amazing. Uh, believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm not on commission here. I just wanted to thank Carlos uh, for such a wonderful uh, gesture. Um, and um, uh, did you know, Claudia, somebody's writing, uh, that Maria, once we received in our classroom Levi Tafara, yes, I know, and uh, Levi again uh, will speak in his Anglo-Caribbean accent, and he's got these wonderful, simple poems, deceivingly, deceptively simple, be because you, you read him and you say, right, uh, this is uh, poetry with very little poetic language, 
really just get the kids reading them and listening to their reggae and rap music and see how much you can do with that. Um, you must have worked with the weather report and and uh, poems like that, which develop a lot of awareness on the issues that we are discussing, global issues that Luciano works so hard on in his school and as a British Council consultant. So what other writers can we suggest? We are just suggesting Levi Tafari. This is another writer I wanted to uh, draw your attention to. John may remember we worked with him in Singapore. Bali Rai is uh, British but of Pakistani origin. And look at the title of his latest book, What's Your Problem? Uh, you, you, you read that and you already notice that you can say, what's your problem? And you can see that, uh, you know, uh, a quarrel or a fight is about to develop. Now look at the uh, cover of the book, and this is even reinforced. And probably, just by looking at the young boy who was chosen for the cover, you can tell there's also a racial background to the issue. So how about choosing at least extracts from a text like this? If there are issues of bullying, of fighting, of discrimination in your classroom. Materials offer opportunities to naturalize, to believe it's normal, that's what I mean, or question discursive construction, such as racial or gender-based stereotypes or the primitive versus civilized binary. Very often, we immediately think that someone coming from the original populations of America or tribal Africa or Australia or New Zealand must be primitive compared to European civilization. Really? Hasn't that been naturalized, uh, made to appear natural and normal in the texts we read? How about challenging that? How about showing texts that probably bring us a picture of these cultures from inside that suddenly make us read the things we ignored completely? Look, we could, for example, question the civilization versus barbarity binary in a story called Teal to Eat by the Aboriginal writer Utkero Nunuka. You can find different spellings for her name, mind you, because it's been anglicized. And we can focus on values. If we learn, even from the title, that Aboriginal children will not kill a bird unless it is meant to be eaten, that they will not go hunting unless there's a reason for it, that they thank the earth for its resources and take care of it, maybe, maybe the primitive ones are those of us who belong to the throwaway society, the ones who uh, discard the things that these children reuse in their everyday lives. So issues that have got to do with global awareness are derived from intercultural awareness. And again, we may question the civilization versus barbarity binary. So, to summarize, what's my proposal? Well, as far as you can, select and design your own materials. If you say, I can't, Claudia, I'm given a textbook and I'm given a syllabus and I've got to follow it. Well, if you're teaching prepositions, that's your teaching unit, wouldn't Michael Rosen's uh, bear hunt be more useful than what you've got as an exercise in the textbook? I'm sure they will never forget uh, in, under, and through if they learn it through that book. So give it a chance. Replace part of your unit by something more enriching. Aim at multimodal communication. Try not only written text, as I'm sure you do, but video, audio, digital products, whatever you can lay your hands on. And let multicultural texts come into dialogue with each other to reflect as much on the other as you do on your own culture, on self and other. Approach texts critically. Question stereotypes like, oh, all original populations are primitive. Focus on values and aim at response through textual intervention. We mentioned some techniques. And last but not least, join the IATEFL Literature, Media and Cultural Studies SIG and the ELT Online Reading Group where we discuss texts for free all together coming from different cultures. That's a wonderful way of developing our own intercultural awareness. 
Just go into the IATFL website and you'll find the link to all the SIGs and you can join there. So, what's the one thought I would like you to take away with you today? That rather to focus only on difference, if we are to respect difference and respect our own identities, we need to highlight our commonalities. And this gives me time for questions. So, let's see if I can see the questions. I've got several questions here. No. Sorry, uh, Claudia, I don't think we have much time for questions. Okay. Do you want to tell a story? So, yeah, we we've got three minutes. minutes. We can go to the story. Uh, because okay. Have, yeah, do you agree with that? All right, we can do that. And then I'll make sure, if possible, I read the questions and I can post a couple of answers on, on the site when you upload the materials. That would be great. I'll do that. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll bring the story. Okay, if you allow me, I will close this session with a story that several of you are acquainted with because I used it at the closing plenary at IFFL and also used it in Portugal. But you know what it's like when you love a story, you want to tell it again. And it's the story of the meeting between the Welsh, the Welsh colonizer, and colonizer, sorry, and the Tewelches in southern Patagonia in Argentina. And if you want to find it, you all you need to do is go to my, my webpage, claudiafradas.net, and you can download the wonderful pictures of Anita Sanfilippo. And uh, as you can see, there's a boat there. That boat was called the Minosa. And that's the boat that arrived in Puerto Madryn, bringing about 150 uh, Welsh colonizers to the Patagonian coast because of an agreement with the Argentine government. This was 1865. And when the boat arrived, poor souls, they arrived 200 miles south of the place they should have reached, and all they could see was sand and sea, and the roaring wind of Patagonia in their ears, and they were getting more and more worried, because there was nothing else to be seen up north, down south, to the west, only the sea on the east, and the boat rocking, and the wind roaring, and they started loading and unloading stuff from the boat, and the minute they brought boxes down, the wind would blow everything away, and they couldn't build their houses. And when they put the walls up, the roof would be blown off. And they were getting more and more worried, because they were getting hungry, they were getting cold. The sweaters they had knitted on board were no use against the Patagonian wind, and they were getting really concerned about the children, especially the children who had been born on board the ship. There were several babies. And not only that, they had read about the local population supposed to be so primitive. These people with long, straight hair who would r ride on horseback and would storm into fortresses and little towns, burn them to their foundations and take the white women away to make them slaves. Was this what was going to happen to their colony? Well, the meeting between the Welsh and the Tewelches, who had been watching them all the time, did not take too long. It happened while the Welsh were carrying out a multiple wedding. And, you know, the music and the dresses were just too much for the Welches to bear. They just had to approach. And when they did, the two groups looked at each other. And the silence was so thick that all you could listen to was the wind roaring between them, putting a borderline between them. And you know what it's like in such a situation? All you need to do is a violent gesture for this to break into riot. And, well, the Tewelche don't need to tell you they didn't speak Welsh. The Welsh didn't speak Tewelche. The interpreters on the boat spoke English and Spanish, the language of two empires. And, well, the story goes, and it's supposed to be true, there are documents in the museum, that Elizabeth Adams, who had given birth to her baby, Maria, stretched her arms and put her baby in the arms of the wife of the Tewelche cacique, you, you know, the, of the Tewelche chief. And this woman knew exactly what this meant. Both women knew that they meant 
No nonsense, gentlemen. No violence here. We want to protect our children. And on the basis of that, which they both had in common, for years and years, that the Welsh and the Welsh collaborated. You can still find in the museum the guanaco ponchos with which the Welsh were saved from pneumonia by the Indians. The way in which the original population, who were nomadic, learned to grow wheat, gather their crop, and make bread. That the Welsh word for bread is bara in Welsh. I know you know that the story does not end there. That in fact, there's not a single Te Welsh left in Patagonia because of a policy that the Argentine government carried out. That the Welsh still remember them, still thank them, because they saved their lives, because they taught them how to survive in Patagonia, and because they gave them the opportunity to teach them what bread was for. I hope we can in some way repeat that aspect of the story. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you everyone for being such active participants on the chat, and I hope to reply to your questions in writing so that you can pick them up later. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, first, I would like to give a huge thanks to Claudia for agreeing to do this webinar and sharing her knowledge and ideas with us. Thank you so much. And as well, a huge thank you to Mercedes Viola and Claire Hart, who were our tech wizards behind the scenes here. I know the participants don't see them, but without them, we cannot hold these webinars. Um, we have the next one in the series coming up. Uh, Mercedes, do we have that slide? Yes. The Jazz of Teaching and Learning with Adrian Underhill, a past president of ITEFL, on the 14th of September, again at 3 p.m. British summertime. And there is another webinar that's organized for those interested in submitting for ITEFL by Madeline du Vivier, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, on how to submit a conference proposal. And that is on the 6th of September at 3 p.m. Take a look at the IFFL webinar site for that. So those who are thinking of, of submitting and are not sure how to do it, have a look at Madeline's uh, very, very helpful webinar. And I thank everyone for taking part today. Hope to see many of you online at the next webinars. And as we said, the slides will be up. Please have patience. It has to go first to head office, and then they have to do it. So it will be sometime next week. And you can take a look at all of this. Claudia is going to kindly answer the questions. And see you online for the next one. And hope to see many of you in Harrogate or at another event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.